Loz, um, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, sir. How are you? Yeah, not too bad, thank you. Glad um, the day of work is over. Um, maybe you want to start off by telling everyone just a little bit about yourself. Just tell them who they tell them who you are. Yeah. Um, so for anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Lauren and I'm a research scientist currently doing a postdoc at AstraZeneca. I also uh, run my Instagram account Loz Calendar and have recently uh, started a small online business called Science Scribbles which I'm going to talk about quite a lot so um, I'm sure you'll hear a lot about that. Um, did you want to do a quick intro Soph? Yeah I guess the best way to describe me is that I'm a stem cell biologist turned into a professional science communicator or at least I like to think so. Um, so I do that full-time um, for a medical research institute in London and then on the side I kind of have my Soph Talk Science brand so started off as a blog merged into Instagram and now I'm hopefully planning a few things for the future as well to make it more of a business hopefully. Okay nice um, I know when I started my Instagram account I think you're actually one of the first people that I followed um, so that was in 2017 um, so for me, I initially started the account actually to promote some YouTube videos that I was creating. Oh, with... I remember your, on your little notepad, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they were kind of science tutorials, I guess, that I had recent, like previously um, developed to teach in schools. And then because I was running out of time during the kind of final bit of my PhD to actually take time out to do that, I thought I'd create some fun YouTube videos. Um, and they initially were called science scribbles because I can't draw. <laughs> so they were quite uh, freehand and a bit rough around the edges. Um, so yeah, I found that there were actually quite a lot of scientists on Instagram, which I hadn't known before that. Do you and, know, can you remember kind of how you found everyone? Do you know what? I, I don't. I don't know. Like, I remember looking at loads of people's YouTubes and like, I think the more traditional like YouTube video science tutorial is people talking to the camera and I just think remember thinking like oh my god I could never do that like I don't think I could record myself um I'd hate watching it back so yeah I came up with the idea and then started looking on Instagram maybe I don't know as a thought of are there people on Instagram saw that there were yeah so started um initially trying to promote those on there but then found that people were actually sharing a lot about their research and their journey which seemed fun. I like to take photos. So yeah, then kind of transitioned more into using the account to document my PhD journey, I guess. And yeah, but you had already been, I think you were already quite well established by that point. Uh, yeah, I can't even, I don't even know when to just say that like I actually started it because it's the same with like my blog. Because I think my blog actually started in 2014 like I clicked Gosh, that's... an account uh, but only because like, that's the year I was graduating and I thought oh I'd love the idea of being a writer but um never actually ended up writing anything so I always kind of say that my blog actually started in 2016 and like 2014 was like the um conception and then 2016 was actually like the actual birth of it and everything like that um but yeah I guess the way I kind of got introduced to science communication was probably quite late I didn't actually realize it was a thing until halfway through my PhD so that's about four years ago now um I ended up having to enter the three minute thesis competition so that's where you have yeah. to describe your thesis using one static slide in three minutes um uh, I've, always loved, watching, it. I've always loved watching those when people used to at our uni as well people are so much better at it now than I was like no one I'd never heard of it before and I don't think anyone around me had heard of it so ended up having to enter it because of the nature of the course I was on for my PhD. Um, really didn't want to, like really <laughs> kicked up a fuss to my supervisor. Um, and then somehow ended up winning it after writing a script and everything. Oh, so I was like, that's hmm, amazing. I'm actually kind of good at this. Um, so that's kind of when I kick started the blog again then. Um, yeah. So it's funny how, yeah, usually the things that you don't want to do that you're kind of forced into end up yeah you end up being quite good at them and then realize that they can be quite enjoyable <laughs> yeah like the first piece of advice I would ever give anyone is to kind of try everything so take the opportunity maybe try like videos as you started off with and maybe try social media or anything like that so I always think that if you try something and you don't like it that's learning just as much as if you do like it so yeah did you think um 
kind of using SciComm through your PhD helped to motivate you? Like um, in the in the lab, or was it more distracting? <laughs> Um, very distracting because I think I didn't have much of a social life. It was mainly in the lab or I was creating stuff for Instagram or the blog. Um, but I enjoyed it, so it didn't really matter. Um, I think it helped me to write my thesis in the end because it really made me take a step back and think about the big picture of my research and how I could describe that to people um, just kind of on the street. So I think it helped that way. But in terms of actual kind of taking my research in one direction or another, probably not. I think that's why I left the lab, really. I yeah. don't really think I was that good of a scientist in coming up with like new questions and things like that. Um, yeah. yeah, I think mine was quite similar in the sense that, yeah, you, it ends up consuming quite a lot of time. <laughs> but lot of time. Um, yeah, no, I think it really helped to motivate me though, because I think at that point, like the halfway point, I'd kind of hit a bit of a, a bit of a lull. The mid-PhD slump, as they call yeah. it. Yeah, and um, although I was, like, I'd met um, some other PhD students in my department, my lab was really small. It was just my supervisor and I for most of my time. And kind of finding lots of scientists on Instagram and being able to, like, connect and talk to them, I think it gave me, like, an extra boost to, like, kind of plow through. And even though, yeah, planning content would take quite a bit of time, it at least made me be organized and forward think and like know that I had to do stuff um so yeah I think it was actually quite useful for my PhD I'm sure I would have been fine if I didn't join <laughs> Instagram but yeah I think it did help now, now you said that that kind of made me think that there are a few people who I've kind of met through Instagram and um, through doing Psycom on Instagram that became really good friends that actually helped actually get me through my PhD because yeah. there were kind of some dark times that um, I was I was going to throw in the towel basically but they kind of pushed me through to kind of get through it all basically yeah I think it's nice although you can make friends in your lab you're not guaranteed to make friends and then being able to like find a, a larger group of people that are maybe struggling yeah, um, yeah it's always um, good to like if you're saying you were only like it was you and your supervisor for most of the time like we were only a small lab group as well I think there was at max three of us at any one time um and then we were sat next to this other lab group that were made up of literally about 50 to 100 people so it was quite almost intimidating in one way yeah um I was actually quite similar we initially were in a different department and everyone was so close knit and they had a really big team and I even though like you're friendly with people you still feel a little bit on the outskirts but yeah I think we've had similar um kind of journeys or timelines in terms of finishing our PhDs as well and then still trying to navigate the psych on Instagram I'm gonna work it out yeah uh, did you expect that you would still kind of keep the account after you finished in the lab yeah I think I wanted to because I now like to think of myself as a bit of an advocate for kind of the so-called alternative like science careers yeah like I, I mentioned I didn't really know that science communication was a thing until halfway through my PhD so me neither I don't think it's very well advertised no. in the kind of academic realm so now like although if you look at my feed now there's no like pretty pictures of like cells or like western blocks or anything like that if they can be pretty <laughs> but um yeah I kind of I kind of miss kind of having that aspect to share but I think recently especially like during lockdown I've been able to really think about what direction I want to take it in um and I think being able to show that a I'm I do science communication full time as one thing but also throughout my PhD then once I discovered science communication I didn't even like no one was able to support me or answer any questions the only yeah. people who I knew that were doing it were kind of other people doing it on Instagram and we were all kind of doing it by trial and error experimenting with different things as I'm sure you know but um, yeah yeah it was trying to then work out what am I going to do with it now um and I'd like to think that I've now finally found what I want to do with it <laughs> yeah no it definitely seems like you've got a new direction and some good plans um I think I'm still trying to figure figure that out for my uh lost calendar account <laughs> Um, how do you kind of balance it with um, like an industry job where there's that kind of more 
but there's kind of barriers with research anyway but I think it's, it's a bit more with industry isn't it yeah so um because I've now transitioned from my PhD to a postdoc uh it's in industry so there's a lot more kind of rules and things that you can and can't post and I think sometimes the lines are a bit blurry but I just don't want to risk overstepping them so in terms of kind of sharing lab-based stuff and research it's a bit harder now and I think other people that are in the kind of psychom Instagram I think have gone through similar things mm -hmm. but it's trying to just figure out what you can share so I can still share stuff about you know like life updates or when I was trying to find jobs I could share tips on stuff like that so that was still useful um, and then because I've set up science scribbles um, and that has kind of taken off since leaving my PhD I've just decided to kind of dedicate a bit more time into that um, so yeah rather than having really lab focused uh, content I guess it's transition a little bit but I don't think science communication has to just be in the lab even though they do make very good pictures <laughs> They do make lovely pictures. Like I really, really miss looking down the microscope and taking photos. Of <laughs> well, but I, I mean, the amount of times that I'd be trying to take selfies in the lab and then someone would walk in. And if it was someone I knew, it would be fine because you'd just be like, oh, just uh, taking a photo. But then if it was someone really senior or like a professor, yeah, I could have yeah, wanted How to run times? in the other direction. How many times has that happened that like someone senior has walked in? Oh, yeah, no, it happened a lot. <laughs> I was in I was in my own little like corner we had like massive like lab bench just for our lab and as I said it was just me and my supervisor so I used to think that I could sneakily try and do it but then there's a door right behind and people would walk through and I'd be like hi um, so yeah most of the photos that are in the lab that are on my Instagram you could assume that I got caught taking them <laughs> how um did kind of they react and then how did like your lab group react then to you sharing all of this on Instagram like were there no I think they were they were all quite cool like they mainly use um Instagram as well maybe not so heavily science focused but some of them do share a bit about their research and my supervisor actually um she's really kind of big on Twitter and every time we used to go to conferences she'd say like oh you should make a science Twitter and then you should connect with these people and it's really useful and she used to tell me that she'd find the best papers through Twitter so even though it wasn't Instagram she was kind of she knew that building those connections and kind of meeting people um, outside of your little bubble is useful in science so yeah I think they were fine I did try and um, occasionally get them to pose with me, which was sometimes struggle because they'd known that they hadn't done their makeup or that they <laughs> <laughs> um, were too busy. But yeah, they enjoyed it. What about you? Did you ever get caught taking photos? Um, I don't think there was many where I got caught. Um, but I do kind of remember that everyone was kind of a bit weird about it initially, especially my supervisor. I don't think they were particularly accommodating to kind of engaging with the public and science communications they didn't really kind of get why I wanted to do it and what I was aiming to try and achieve um but I think kind of by the end of my PhD I think they had come around to it a bit more because I think there was one opportunity I remember where someone was asking me to record a video but they wanted me to do it in the lab so um I thought I bet I think before I was kind of sneakily trying to take the photos when no one was watching. Yeah. Um, in a safe way, of course. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> Full PPE. Obviously. And then, um, yeah, with this video, I thought, well, I better ask them, like, their permission to take it in the, in the lab. But um, they just outright said no and kind of, I think from then they actually kind of discovered that I had this Instagram page and was kind of, kind of following along, although she wasn't on social media at all. Um, but kind of followed along from then and kind of was realizing then what I was doing and I think then the blogging award that I got kind of helped with that to show that I was kind of doing it good at doing it and was responsible about with what I was doing and yeah and also that people were interested you wouldn't have won that award if people weren't keen to connect I yeah. think it's like scientists in general there seems to be maybe I forget this sometimes because I see so many people doing science communication on Instagram but there is like a group of scientists that are still not convinced that it's necessary so um, I guess for anyone 
wanting to kind of start their Instagram accounts is important to try and check first. I don't know how their um, superiors would react. Yeah, I would definitely, I think probably one of the regrets probably was not being quite as open and honest about it. Not that I was trying to keep it a secret or anything, but I think I was scared of being judged and people sort of coming down on me like a ton of bricks or whatever and making me stop really when it was something I enjoyed doing and I wanted to do and the more I did it I was like I kind of want to do this as a career so I think the further along it then got the more difficult it got to tell people so I think if I had done that at the beginning maybe it would have made things a little bit easier but who knows. Um, And when did you um, kind of you said you had like started in 2014 and then kind of dabbled in and out when do you think um it really like took off was it when you won the award or before that point I'm not really sure you know I think um I maybe might be a little bit lucky in the fact that I was probably amongst some of the first people who started doing it so I think as more and more people sort of discovered it um I was probably in that kind of group that everyone sort of followed right from the bat um because I was trying to work out like how did I go from sort of zero to sort of 10k and I was just like I didn't have any particular strategy or plan or anything and then I don't remember getting a rush of followers after anything in particular so I think it was just like consistency and slow steady growth really I have found now that after I have finished my PhD that my growth has slowed somewhat and I think that I've talked about this with other people and after they finish their PhD because I think their audiences are so PhD student focused um, I haven't got any research to show so I think the engagement has kind of dropped a little bit and I think more often than not I have days where I lose followers rather than gain followers so I don't know if you've kind of experienced anything similar since you finished your PhD. Yeah no I definitely have since finishing my PhD but again I think it's because with that account anyway, I, I'm not entirely sure of the direction. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit less consistent. So now it's kind of, I've t- kind of jumped most of my time into growing science scribbles, which is growing really nicely. So I think the consistency in the science scribbles is working really well. <laughs> Whereas yeah, with the Lord's Calendar account, um, I think it grew so much just when I started showing more about kind of my journey like I said initially it was more to promote videos and I think I kept myself out of it quite a bit and then as soon as I let I mean I still don't share loads about my life outside of the lab I guess but the more I was sharing more about my journey from my PhD I was gaining um kind of followers I remember my first 1000 actually all my all my friends were teasing me none of them are scientists and we use like they use Instagram but mainly just to post photos of like us and friends like not um for anything in particular so yeah I remember they were teasing me when it was a thousand and I was like oh my god I can't believe I've got a thousand followers and then yeah I don't know I don't know how it seemed to jump to 10,000 but I think it was mainly just by being open and kind of um yeah sharing as well some of the struggles of a PhD Mm -hmm. rather than just oh look at this nice data but kind of sharing how stressful it is to write a thesis and then submit the thesis and then have to make corrections and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, I think something that worked kind of well for me last year was because I submitted my thesis in September 2018, had my Viva in December 2018, but then I didn't graduate until the following July. So I think it was kind of showing people that even though you've passed your Viva, you still have all these other steps and boxes to hoops to jump through which I didn't know kind of existed when I was starting my PhD so I think me neither that so, kind of worked well for me like last year yeah it's it's a long process and I think you think that when you finish your thesis like oh I'm basically done I yeah. know yeah I think I'm similar timeline to you but a year later mm-hmm. so I'd submitted in oct- the beginning of October then had my Viva December um I mean I still haven't graduated because of this year but I got I my know one though didn't you yeah we had a virtual one um and I've got my certificate and stuff now so that's it feels more official but um yeah I don't think that's something that people or well I didn't know as you said that you didn't either that it's it's quite draining even after you finished yeah I still he- sit like here now on weekends when I'm doing other stuff thinking oh there's still like two papers I could write like I yeah. can do them at some point 
yeah my supervisor's watching this you'll probably be saying yes Lauren can you <laughs> hurry up and write your final paper which I will do I promise um how do you find juggling um everything now that you do have a job so like the blog and Instagram and everything yeah it, it's a struggle especially with four hours of commuting a day well at least it was kind of last year before um a global pandemic hit um yeah I think I was I was doing really badly at it to be honest I wasn't planning it as much as I should have been and now since lockdown I've been able to um invest in a coach really because I want to kind of head more in the kind of business direction so just working with her has been able to help me really think about planning and scheduling things and mainly time batching and batching content just so I'm not spending my whole weekend doing Instagram and then blogs and things like that and I think also recently because I've been trying to rework my website a little bit so it isn't just a blog um, I haven't been writing any blogs so that's kind of taken one thing off my shoulders but um, I'm that type of person who always wants to do more like I want to try and start this podcast I want to try and do all these other things in like the business thing that I'm trying to work on um, so yeah it's difficult really I don't know if you must have had the same sort of struggles yeah I guess um yeah I mean my job obviously takes priority and it, it was the same when I was doing my PhD that has to be kind of the main priority um and then now I would say that science scribbles and kind of managing that Instagram account is the second priority so the last calendar is like but yeah trying to plan ahead I think always helps me I'm not always the best at it and sometimes I might have a really busy weekend or I just want a weekend where I'm not thinking of work so I won't plan but if I do get some time at the weekend I try and make sure that I've got everything kind of organized before and then I don't really need to think about it. How far uh, do you try and plan in advance? Oh like just the next week although sometimes if I I used to do this more for my PhD when I was yeah trying to think of photos I could take in the lab um if I ever came up with like a fun idea or something I'd just jot it in my note like section of my phone yeah. um so sometimes if I'm really struggling I'll just go through that and see what kind of ideas I had when I was in more of a creative mindset um but yeah usually just the week ahead and it's more to make sure that I've got I guess photos that I can use because mm. sometimes I can think of great captions or like interesting tips that I'd want to share but then I don't have anything to actually post with I guess that's the thing with Instagram because it's so uh picture focused and I do think people you could spend all the time in the world writing a great caption but if you don't have something that's going to stop people's attention I do think sometimes it gets lost which is a shame so yeah the main bulk of like planning I think for me is trying to think of what photos I can take I don't know if you've the photo thing at the moment because like I don't have it like I can't just like turn around and be like oh yeah it's me at my desk again like I'm <laughs> working on another document I'm writing another article so it's kind of thinking do I need to go down more of say like the the lifestyle or like the beauty blogger type thing and go and have like photos in the park or go to like like I'm just I don't I think I need to maybe think outside of the box without it being too weird. <laughs> I think the weirder the better. You should just do a really random photo that doesn't match in some like fancy dress or something. Yeah, in the park. <laughs> get people's attention. I could get like my wedding dress back on and just head out into the field and just... Yeah. <laughs> then, then I'm sure you'd get some strange looks by people <laughs> in the park. Mm. Look, how is it kind of because you not only have like the full-time job and then one Instagram account, you kind of have the two. So was there kind of any decision initially to think maybe I should just keep it to one Instagram account or? Yeah, and uh, yeah, definitely. And I think, um, as I kind of said in the intro, the my first account was meant to be to promote science skills. I mean, at the time that was a different thing. It was the YouTube channel, it was the hand-drawn tutorials, whereas now it's um, kind of a, a small online gift shop if you will, where I'm like selling lots of stickers and pins and stuff. So I think because the content was quite different, I decided to split it. And I do think that was a good shout. I think now though, what I'm realizing on the Science Scribbles account is to get it to grow more, it is nice to share some of my own personal stuff on there. Mm -hmm. I think even with business accounts, people appreciate learning a bit about you. And although some of them might follow the Laws Calendar one, not everyone will. So I started now 
trying to allocate some content to that but then it obviously means I'm then struggling for content for the other one so it is a bit hard to juggle both um but yeah I think it's just figuring out priorities of what what I want to focus most of my time on I mean both of us have full-time jobs and we can't do everything even though we might want to so yeah I think just prioritizing things is the main thing yeah I guess kind of from having this whole like side business there must have been loads of opportunities that you kind of gained from especially like growing now so well on Instagram with it as well so I don't know like what opportunities have you got from starting science scribbles or even just sharing your research on Instagram yeah I mean well I mean being able to start science scribbles was definitely the biggest opportunity and that um yeah kind of I guess allows me to have a little bit of extra income not not loads more but like a little bit so that's always useful um and then through my other one just kind of opportunities like this I guess like being able to talk about my journey and like everything that I'm doing um had some collaborations with um various companies uh throughout like along the way as well so that's been good I mean you've just done a TED talk so (laughs) that's surely a great opportunity that you've had it was a great opportunity but I was it was a bit weird because not only did I record it in in this room which was a bit odd to start off with um they wanted me to talk about like a science topic as well so when I haven't been in the lab for two years it was kind of weird and I was like am I going to be able to talk about stem cells again so um but yeah no that it was a fantastic opportunity and I don't think it's live anywhere yet so no one has really seen it so I might keep it that way so I don't ruin the (laughs) ruin the illusion that I'm really good at this <laughs> I'm sure it's great um what about challenges it's not kind of always rosy um yeah I think we've mainly covered so the main challenge I guess for me with juggling all these things is learning how to say no to certain opportunities because mm-hmm. you do get opportunities and uh, it's in my nature to just say yes to everything but then I obviously have to prioritize just the same no what about you Um, Yeah, the same thing. And also then with my supervisor kind of getting them on side initially. But I think more recently it was um, trying to find like my own voice and my own way on using science communication on Instagram. Because I think I always, there's so many people on there that inspire me and I kind of aspire to be like, and they're doing incredible, incredible things. Um, But I think sometimes I just need to take that step away and almost temporarily unfollow them just because you kind of get too close to them and you kind of see that what's working well for them and you kind of want to imitate that so I think it's just learning to find what I want to share and what is going to bring people to me and listen to me almost yeah um right I think we're probably near the end should we um end by maybe sharing kind of our two top tips for anyone that might want to yeah. start a psych on Instagram I don't know if you've got two that you want to share Um, I think my go-to tip would be um, firstly before you even start to think about why you're going to do it because as we've mentioned it takes up a lot of time and effort and creativity so really thinking about why your motivation is for doing it is a good part I think Um, and then my other one would kind of be um, community over competition because I think it's it's natural for us all to get obsessed with like the follow account and the number of likes on a photo um I used to do it and I learned this the hard way um I think then now I focus more on kind of the number of saves my post has got or the number of shares because that means it's got more value than someone just clicking like uh, I yeah. think it is. and kind of the conversations I now have in my dms because people because of the relationships I've kind of built with people it even though I'm not growing as much as I was maybe what I do now to me feels so much more meaningful so I'd always say community and think about the relationships you're building rather than the number of people that follow you yeah no I definitely agree I think for me yeah I think for me mine would be to make sure whatever you're sharing is kind of understandable Mm -hmm. um kind of make sure the content that you're sharing yeah can be utilized by a wide audience so don't make it too science heavy uh which for scientists can be quite hard and then I think just also to have fun with it so like 
Absolutely. It's not meant to be a chore. It's meant to be something that you can enjoy um, and not to let it interfere with everything kind of else going on. I guess that'd be mine. Yeah, the fun is definitely the key one there, I think, because people can think it, it will take up a lot of time, but I think it's like any sort of hobby, really. If you want to put the time into it and, in, and you enjoy it, it will it'll all fall into place, really. Yeah, I agree. Um, great. I don't know if you want to kind of wrap up by reminding people where they can find you online and tell people all about what they can buy from you at Science Scribbles, because it probably reminds me that I need to go buy a, a load more <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. So um, my two Instagram accounts are loscalendar underscore. And on that one, you can find lots of PhD related content if you scroll back a bit. Um, and then also I've got my Science Scribbles account, which is science.scribbles. Um, and I sell lots of science themed goodies. So stickers, pins, um, kind of, yeah, all your geeky, chic accessories that you might want to buy for yourself or a friend. I like that. Geeky, chic accessories. That's yeah um so where can we find you Soph? um i'm at soph.talks.science um yeah or soph.science.com um i guess what i'm you can find with me is just how i do a science communication career and what that's like um i'm trying to share more tips about um how people can get started in science communication and build their confidence in doing that alongside a phd or as a career um, and then hopefully in the very near future, I'll be launching some um, science communication like courses and how to's and, nice. and hopefully we'll have a mini collaboration in the work soon as well. Yes. <laughs> we can talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's been lovely to talk to you and learn more about your journey because although we've meant like chatted before, I don't, I didn't know a lot about that. No, I think, yeah, this is the longest we've uh, kind of spoken. So it's been lovely. Yeah. Thanks, so. We'll chat soon.